Hello, sisters and brothers. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our web debate that we're going to have today on safe return to work. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. And I, I would like to, first of all, apologize that we are doing this only in English, but we'll come the, the opportunity where we, we will, will be, make it in, another, in other languages for us to, um, to start uh, uh, the process that everybody can, can profit from, from our debates. Today, the idea is that we, we, we discuss the process that we, most of our unions around the world are experiencing in return to work. We've been through these unprecedented times with a pandemic, with high demand on, on health and safety issues to protect the health and safety of our members was the first priority for all our unions around the world. And then we have to cope also to the consequences, the socioeconomical consequences of this pandemic and also um, what is up to, to us as union leaders to guide our process into a safe return to work, protecting the health and safety, but also at the same time coping to the protection of the of the income and the jobs of our members worldwide. And to tell, uh, to tell you about uh, the issue today, we have our, with me here, our Assistant General Secretary, Kamal Khan. He'll make a presentation of one of our guides that we prepared, because one of the things that we're doing during the pandemic times is to provide some assistance, some guidance to our unions in health and safety, in, in safe, uh, uh, the, the refusal of unsafe work and also uh, advice for employers and employees in terms of uh, health and safety during the pandemic times. And now we just uh, uh, launched a guide about the safe return to work where we collected some of the experience of, from our affiliates. And uh, we want to share with you today this, uh, this guide and also get some uh, experiences from affiliates uh, that have uh, made up to have good uh, experience in negotiating this kind of process with their employers, with sectors, and we want to hear their experience and then we will have some time to uh, exchange uh, with the, the questions that people can, can uh, ask to us and ask the panelists uh, through the Facebook and YouTube. So we have with us today, Sister Kainzar. She is the president of International uh, Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar, very strong in the, in the textile and garment sector. We have with us brother Terry Dittes, the vice president of the United Auto Workers from US with vast experience in, in uh, the auto industry, most of all, but also other sectors. We have our brother, Michael Michel. He is the International Secretary of uh, CNM CUT, the Confederation of Metal Workers of CUT Brazil, mostly in all the metal sectors. And we have with us, brother Michael Volters, Secretary of International Union Policy of IGBCE, the International Union for uh, Mining, Chemical and Energy from Germany, with also with a vast uh, experience that we would like to, to share with you today. So I will ask our, our, our brother Kamal here with me to make a, a, a presentation of the, the guide that we shared with you and we can show you that you can find it in our website. And then after the, his presentation, I will ask each of the panelists today um, to uh, share their experience. And then we will have some time for question and answers uh statements and then we, we we can have the panelists again to have another round so uh, I, I would just like to apologize our brother uh, david sipunzi from uh, national unions of, of mine workers from south africa he just excused the last minute for some urgent issues that in his union he cannot be with us today but i i think uh, our panelists will will really uh, make a great contribution for us so over to you, Kamal. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Indeed, as you mentioned, since the beginning of the crisis, um, uh, we have been giving assistance uh, um, uh, to our affiliates uh, 
we had discussion about how to shut down, what should be the conditions of shutdown, or uh, what we should do um, when uh, there is a partly continuation in production, and all those details for health and safety, for income security, how to negotiate it. Now, since the lockdown conditions are being eased or lifted, uh, the main discussion and the main assistance we are sought uh, from our affiliates is how to uh, return back to work. I think this is an important issue. When we look at the, the country's experiences, we see it at national level regulations by the governments and sectoral level uh, 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 regulations and also plant level uh, agreements and the guidance. Actually, it is for sure that when we talk about uh, resumption of uh, production and the work, then we refer to a safe work. Health and safety is number one priority for unions, for workers. If it is not safe, then uh, there is no way to return back. That is number one priority. So the question, what are we going to negotiate, regulate, and how are we going to do it? And uh, uh, how are we going to make sure monitoring uh, uh, these uh, uh, regulations? Of course, health and safety is number one. And for industrial global union, it is foremost, utmost, an issue of fundamental rights. When we refer to health and safety, we refer to two, three main rights. Right to know, and all the other hazards, risks at workplace, and it, this needs to be uh, supported by training, education, and the right to shut down or refuse unsafe work, which is guaranteed by international conventions, uh, national regulations. And finally, um, a right to participate in all decision-making, uh, implementation of programs, procedures, uh, accident, incident investigations at workplaces. So this is why it is important that so we have a, a, a uh, uh, insurance that the, these three rights are in place. And uh, surely a risk assessment and how uh, we need a risk assessment before we return to work. And uh, uh, analysis of all the hazards, all the risks at workplace. And please check our website. We have just urged uh, the government of uh, in, in India because after uh, restarting to work, then uh, we see a series of accidents in the chemical industry. <coughs> and uh, that means there is no proper risk analysis because you left uh, uh, the workplace three months ago on working and you returned back without checking anything. Any preparation. Without, any preparation. Now imagine your car, you put it somewhere three months ago and then you return to take it again but uh, uh, it is not sure that so you can again run it. So this is why it is, it is quite important. And we also need to uh, re-regulate uh, all those um, uh, uh, modalities, uh, access of workers, access of third parties, subcontractors, and cleaning, disinfection, and a per, uh, a personal hygiene precautions, personal protective equipment, uh, uh, and a special sanitation, and uh, uh, shared uh, places like toilets, like uh, showers, like restaurants, canteens. So this requires a big set of health and safety regulations with the involvement of all the workers representatives. And of course, it requires a new work organization. Okay, we return back to the factory, to workplace. Then there should be a new work uh, uh, organization uh, looking at social distancing, looking at uh, uh, the human uh, contact. And it also requires uh, involvement of uh, workers' uh, representatives. And uh, at this point, if you allow me, I also want to refer to the particular situation of gender. For example, personal uh, protective equipment uh, uh, don't fit very well. To uh, do, uh, then we need to redesign it. We need to adapt it to the um, uh, uh, the gender issues, and surely schooling, childcare, 
and it is not sure that so those uh, premises are available for women workers, for male workers, single parents. How are we going to make sure that so those facilities are in place and the uh, governments and employees should take responsibility for uh, those issues and transportation. Now, everywhere in all the countries, it is said that the public transport is still risky and how the workers are gonna go to work and what kind of uh, regulations we are gonna put uh, in uh, that sense. And I also want to raise the issue of mental health. Now, during this COVID-19 process, it was already a case for us, but uh, how are we going to avoid, overcome all the challenges of mental health? Because people have fear, worry of uh, infection of COVID-19, then this is now an issue. It needs to be part of the whole uh, package. And another question, symptoms, uh, how are we going to uh, detect people? How are we uh, going to put uh, the, such regulations? Uh, and also tracing, tracking, and also uh, um, uh, information. And uh, now we will have a quite the case information and uh, privacy of those information. How are we going to keep them in uh, a place? That, that's why it is quite important that so there is a big picture with health and safety, with um, uh, 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 different regulations of work organization, but at the same time, there is a dimension of income. Income uh, in new work organization, if I come um, with less working hours, what is gonna happen uh, for my uh, income, for my wage, then there should be a regulation and protection uh, for that. And also when I am, uh, detected as infected, what is going to be sickness payment, what is going to be um, uh, the whole uh, the issue of subsidies of uh, wages. So this is a huge package. So with, with, uh, with our um, uh, the guidance, we just wanted to highlight all those points when our affiliates negotiate a deal for returning back, then there should be all the elements in that deal. Then uh, we have also shared examples from different countries. In some countries, the governments uh, made regulations how to return to work. And there are examples where the unions were part of this negotiation. And we have also shared some examples uh, uh, with sectorial level deals like in Spain, in Italy, and the social partners came together and they discussed the general rules for the sector concerned so that the workers and the companies can return back. And finally, workplace level uh, agreements. And it, it, this is the critical point, how to return back, uh, looking at all the details at workplace level. And there are very good examples over there. And Industrial Global Union during this crisis um, uh, has uh, as, uh, 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 offered assistance to its affiliates, one of which is to create that kind of platform where we exchange information and experience. I think this is one of the issues that uh, we will continue to do so. So uh, at this stage, let me stop. Oh. And I'm sure there will be some questions with inputs uh, from the, uh, the participants, then we can uh, enter into some of the details uh, in case uh, there is an interest and question. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, look, we, 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 we try to, to, to have today, uh, our guests uh, today, our brothers and sisters that have experience in different sectors, because we try in different regions of the globe, that we want to have this kind of diversity of experiences. That's the, the richness of, of this organization, that we can profit from experience from another, learn from each other's experience. And, and you know, in this, in this pandemic, we have a number, the, the sectors are not affected the same. We have some, some sectors which are supplying to the, to the front line, for example, chemical, pharmaceutical, uh, pulp and paper, and some others that are, you know, they're, in high demand, they practically they didn't stop at all in this process. We have uh, other sectors which are just uh, supplying business to business, or they, they don't supply to consumers, but they supply to companies. 
and, and then we have mining, base metals, uh, uh, and, and uh, mechanical engineering, shipbuilding, for example. They are dependent on the whole uh, performance of the society, of the economy and society at large. And we have some, some others which are uh, dependent on consumption, like auto, like textile and garment, like ICT electroelectronic. And so they are affected many dif much differently because of uh, consumption. And they, among those sectors uh, of consumption, uh, textile and garment is one of, of uh, high uh, problem for us because it's a very fragile global supply chain where uh, employers play uh, a very tough role. Brands put pressure on suppliers to reduce costs, to reduce prices, and that that pressure is transferred to the unions, to workers that are not allowed to organize in unions. And at the same time, the companies try to protect themselves and their shareholders and not protect the workers in this pandemic. So I would like to start with our sister, Kainzar, that has an experience with Myanmar to, to share her experience from her union, or, uh, specifically on textile and garment sector in, in Myanmar. So sister Kainzar, welcome. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you, brother. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to speak uh, the, about the situation in Myanmar, especially in the government sector regarding with the safety issue. Myanmar has hit the pandemic by the week of March this year. Now there are 293 confirmed cases by 25th of June. In that of that we, um, in the that we of June, sorry, in the that we of March, Myanmar migrant workers returned home from Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, etc. Myanmar could not control the process to check COVID-19 infection of all the thousands returned migrant workers. We start, uh, found out the positive COVID-19 patients in that week from the group. Trade unions raised about the COVID-19 positive impacts to industries in the beginning of March, such as how to prevent the virus infection, how to support workers during the lockdown period, and how to pay and who to pay if companies are needed to close temporarily because of the COVID-19 impacts. When the imported COVID-19 cases were found, trade unions suggested at the national Trabadai meeting to close all the factories for one man in April. Due to about 70,000 migrants return home, and they are spread into all the regions and divisions of Myanmar, including industry zones. The factory in the industry zone are crowded, and trade unions were worried about COVID-19 outbreak in the industry zones. Trade unions demand to government, to the government and the employers where, number one, to close all the factory temporary in April. Number two, for payment in April, there are 10 days water festival holidays and four Sundays, which workers are entitled to get the daily wage. Therefore, trade union proposed to pay workers the minimum wage in division of 60% paid by the government from the social security fund and 40% paid by employers because they are responsible for the Gazada holidays. Number three, our demand was that employers prepare the workplace to be safe and healthy and what plan for how to continue their work after April. Trade union understand those employers need to restructure their workplaces to continue factories in compliance with the Ministry of Health guideline for the factories. According to the MOHS guideline, factories are difficult to continue with the existing structure they may need to reduce workforces and work as shift nature or changing the working hours, as well as they may need to adjust the salary of workers. However, the government in Embraer did not take 
consideration the trade union suggestion at the national level. Then at the factory level, I know we have decided to do media campaign, poster campaign to make the government hear our voices to close factories in April to avoid pandemic outbreak. That was ignored too. After we realized the government does not listen to us, our member unions started negotiation with their employers to close factories in April and they negotiated wages. Mostly workers are not getting payment for the days supposed to work in April, but workers have to agree because they are afraid of infection. Some factories signed an agreement, many were not agree the demands of the union. After Wada Festival holiday on 20 or the 20th of April, all the factories have to resume their works. The Ministry of Labor make announcement all their companies will be allowed to resume after investigated and complied the MOHS Ministry of Health guideline on 19th of April, one day before the factory resume. However, many factories were resumed without following the instruction or MOHS health guideline. So we trade union collected the information about the factories which are not complying the health guideline. And we sent 67 factories report to different ministries, but no reports are replying or taking actions by the government. Trade union trying to negotiate with the employers to comply the COVID-19 health guideline and offer union would work together with them. But uh, the employers refused to discuss with the union. So I know of and did a photo media campaign by sharing and holding pictures of crowded ferries no social distancing at the factories, and then face masks or hand gel are not provided. Fingerprint system are stay in use, etc. The things for our campaign was no social distancing, no social justice. I would like to con conclude my intervention here with the words that workers return to work and safe and stay feeling afraid because of no preventive measure for the COVID-19 mm. at batteries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sister Kainzar. That was an impressioning struggle. I mean, we are very honored to have you and your union, your federation among our ranks, because you know that's the, the game employers and governments play. They try only to focus on the on the profits. And it's up to, to the, the workers to stand up. And most of all, when they have a strong union that fight for their rights, like the IWFM from Myanmar. Thank you very much, sister. Now we move on to another continent that unfortunately, while we see that the pandemic is being under control, the contagion in Europe, for example, in most of the countries in, in Southeast Asia, we see that unfortunately, Brazil, US, the Americas in general, the pandemic is still on the rise and it's a challenge for the unions to, to go on this period. So I will ask uh, first uh, our brother from, uh, uh, from US, our brother Terry Didis, vice president from the UAW to share the experience that they are having through this pandemic and especially the, the, the successful agreements on return, safe return to work that the UAW negotiated with the auto companies. Brother Davis, please, you have the floor. Yeah. Unmuted. Unmute, please. You just need to unmute. unmute. Got it. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, brothers. Thank you for the invite. Uh, I bring greetings from our president, uh, UAW president, Rory Gamble, and it's an honor to be a part of this. So I'm going to kind of walk through this the whole setup um, back in March, when the cases were 
flaring up here in the U.S. Cases all across the country were popping up in certain regions. It was a heavy lift for our union to get the auto companies to shut the factories. You know, they don't, they don't want to stop making product. They don't want to stop making money. And um, somewhere around March 19th, we closed our first GM facility. Ford and FCA and the vice presidents there, respective vice presidents were working on them. Um, the other industries, um, our secretary treasurer has Ag Imp, uh, heavy truck. So we were all working towards the same thing. So when, when we started that systematic shutdown to get our people out of the workplace and let them quarantine at home, our president, Rory Gamble, set up a task force where we gathered all the top leadership, all the vice presidents, the secretary treasurer, and all the CEOs from the auto companies. And we would have calls to go through some of these items because once we shut them down, we knew that the task of getting them back to work was gonna be just as difficult or more difficult. So that also had to be systematic. We developed in the auto industry, we developed what we call a playbook. Each company um, had input. We would meet uh, very periodically to give our insight to what we think the environment should look like when our members went back to work. That was uh, very successful. I got to say that the the auto companies were very um, reactive. They were very cooperative to make sure that when we do go back to the factories, that we were following the WHO, the CDC guidelines, and trying to exceed them in any way that we could. And here in the US, the, um, the auto companies, namely Ford and General Motors, kind of pitched in right away. And they started making face masks, PPAE, and they made masks and ventilators. So they were joining the cause. And um, we were pretty proud of, of those kind of actions, you know, because we continued to work with them. They pitched in for the good of the whole country. So, you know, that, that to me is something that has not really been talked about, but you know, they did step up. Um, yes, we push them. Yes, we encourage them. But, um, you know, they, they tried their best to help the whole nation. But so then it was about May 18th, we started to return the auto um, manufacturers. We started to return on a very slow basis our people back to the workplace. And we would start a shift at a time. Some of them are still not fully up and running. And that's mainly because of demand, because there's so many unemployed um, Americans right now. Our unemployment rate is probably 14% at minimum. Um, the, the figures are that 40 million people have applied for unemployment. So it's a staggering thing. So they're not really, the first priority is not about what's my next car going to be or truck. So the demand is low. The economy is, is, is off the rails right now. But we have returned, I would say, in General Motors alone, probably 75 to 80% of our people back in the factory. We, so after our task force and we created this playbook, we then shared that with all our local union leadership. As, as the director of the GM department, um, we sent it out to the leadership. We, we encouraged them to sit down with their management, the local management for their specific location and walk through the details and make suggestions of how they can make it the safest place to be 
when they returned to work. And this is all before they came back. Well, our leaders, have, they definitely dived into this. They improved the playbook locally. And we, and we did a lot of the things that were, you know, everybody talks about the hand cleaning and the sanitizers and, and in every GM location, you must wear a mask at all times. You must wear safety uh, glasses for those that, um, those that have pre-existing conditions and they want an N95 mask that's provided for them. If they're um, in a situation, say they're building a truck and they're in the cab and one's working underneath here and three or four feet away, someone else is putting electrical units under the dash. They're in close proximity all day long. Those people uh, can get uh, face shields. We have looked at the change of shifts. We didn't want thousands of people brushing against each other. Um, and each local union, every one of them is different because we have plants that have up to 5,000 people. So, you know, and they're all configured differently. So they knew best, what was the best practices? Limiting the entrances, um, staggering the shifts, right? All those kind of things. And we have had some cases since they started to return. But what happens is when we get those cases, those people are quarantined and then the contact tracing um, occurs. Now, contract tracing, the contact tracing is a very difficult thing, but that's how you contain this virus. So you know, there's a there's a lot of people in the workplace now because of the work that we did to get here actually have said they feel safer in the plants than they do in the grocery store. I mean, we have put everything that we can think of and it's changing by the day. And I, we've been in recent discussions with General Motors and we're actually working on a, a device that it's very small. It's like the size of a credit card that each member can have within the plant. So if they become infected, that this can track who they were close to rather than a memory thing. Because if you think about your everyday life and, and if you became infected today and, you, and they said, well, who have you been around in the last two weeks? You have a pretty good memory of it. But you cannot remember every single person. So we're, we're working with, with General Motors to try to develop this. And this is clearly not a tracking device. But if in the event that you do get infected, it will pinpoint who you were in contact with. And then those people can be tested and or quarantined. And then it slows down the, the, the virus. So, you know, this thing's evolving. And, and here in the U.S., unfortunately, as you just mentioned, brother, it's not getting better. 26 of our 50 states are now rising every single day. And we in General Motors have plants all over the country. So, you know, some states are doing really well. Some states are starting to reopen very cautiously. I was on a call last night with the state of Michigan, uh, which we have a lot of auto there, and they have been doing a great job. They have been very cautious. The, the governor there has been very restrictive of what is being allowed. And quite frankly, the governor of Michigan has taken a lot of heat for that because you know, in, in today's society, people are like, well, I want to get out. I want to get my hair cut. I want to get my tattoos. I want to go to the bar. Well, you know, she has taken a position, a very strong position and stuck with it. And the success is in the numbers and in the science. But unfortunately, we have a really mixed message here in the U.S. We have we have a, a Democrat, Republican kind of structure here, almost to the point where 
I'm not wearing a mask because this is a hoax and, and you know, I, I don't need to protect you or myself. And we can see how that's going. And then, you know, if you're wearing a mask, well, you must be a Democrat. It's, it's very, it's, it's a shameful situation and we are embarrassed. Yes, I know you're laughing, but it's an embarrassing situation. And, you know, for the good of the country, we could not all unite and do the same thing and protect others, protect our families. And we, and quite frankly, if you look at the data in the last couple of days, we in the United States are back where we were back in April. There, we set records in the last two days for confirmed cases. Now, I'm confident that all the protocols that we set in our plants on behalf of our members are very good. We have to continue to work on them and things will come up and we'll develop new theories because this is not going away. This is not miraculously going away. The sun isn't going to make it go away. All those wishing things and, and testing less is not the solution because all we're doing is hiding the truth. But so we have all those things going on and we know this is going to continue. But when those members leave the plants that we've worked so hard to make safe, we don't know what they're going to do after their work. After work, they, they could gather at a, at, with large amounts of people who are infected and then come to work the next day and infect some of our members. So we have to, we have to know that, yes, we put a lot of good things in place. We're very uh, proud of that. And we worked with the auto companies closely on this. Um, but, you know, we have to continue to be vigilant, you know, and I wish that the country, I wish the United States of America was as vigilant as we are in our plants today. But um, that's pretty much the overview um, of where we were, where we are, and how we want to continue to work and keep our members and our families safe. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Brother Didis. It was an impressive, very impressive uh, presentation. I, I really praise the experience of the UAW, especially the contribution in, in producing, I mean, reconverting the plants to produce uh, supplies for the front lines, like ventilators. That was really amazing. And, you know, talking about embarrassment with the government, I will invite our brother from Brazil, from CNN Good Brazil, to talk about what the real embarrassment is about, <laughs> about the sure. government in, in, in the fight of the pandemic. And also is a, is a confederation that has uh, some experience also negotiating with some auto companies that in terms of uh, changing the shifts. I mean, just... Brother okay, Michael, well. welcome thank and just for well. contribution. Thank you, everybody. Hi, brothers and sisters. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. First of all, I would like to give a, a shortly overview of the current uh, political situation in Brazil uh, and the attacks of the, against the working class. Since the coup that took place in, in, in 2016, uh, uh, that removing the democratically elected President Dilma uh, from the power, the, go the legitimate government who took, the, uh, took over the, 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 the country uh, implement a lot of ultra-liberal measures. Uh, we suffer a systematic attack against the, the workers' rights. Uh, since the, 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 the coup outsourcing laws have been approved in restrained, in restrained uh, uh, outsourcing laws. Uh, that uh, the, the criminalization of the unions is it, it's common. Uh, the left wing parts criminalization is it, also something common, like in, in work party and the social movement, like the the, the land workers movement. Uh, uh, this this uh, this. Uh, uh, attack were institutionalized through an economic persecution, a brutal repression against the mass uh, demonstration, 
and illegal arrests of social political leaders like uh, uh, our former president Lula and even a murder uh, such as Marielle Franco cases as uh, uh, every, uh, every word uh, are uh, following this 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 this, this things and and a, a, a labor reform laws was approved during that time. They removed social security rights and turned precarious all the, the relations and works. Besides that, they create uh, loopholes that exclude union uh, in agreements between workers and employers. Our economy and social conditional were already very bad before the pandemic. It's crazy, but uh, the, the, the common say, uh, the popular say we are uh, adopting Brazil, it's not, it's too bad that can get worse, yes? Since the coup in Brazil. Uh, and then uh, uh, facing the starvation of the government at the, in the beginning of pandemic, we negotiate a, 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 an anticipation of publication and workers uh, uh, bank to keep the workers isolated in their homes. Uh, while the governments around the world have invested funds to back up the companies in order to maintain job, the salary power of the workers and implement social programs to go through this pandemic crisis, Bolsonaro government does not just does not don't support the companies, but in addition, it has cut income from the working class. So the working class pay the price of the, the crisis. Uh, uh, they they approve a provisional measure uh, that number nine three six was approved, which established a series of attacks and reduced rights for the workers, but mainly attacks the work organization. Uh, this measure permit to the company, crazy, to permit to the company suspend the works contract for the four months and pay just 30% of the wages during that time. Another uh, big problem, a big issue about this measure is the possibility to make an individual agreement between workers and employers. This concerns us uh, a lot. In this scenario, Without any government support, without any law to, to back up uh, uh, the, the workers, uh, union movements in Brazil have been struggling to negotiate some agreements in different sectors to guarantee income to the workers, health and safe condition in, in the workplace, but mostly to maintain the life of the working class. In metal worker sector, Many of our unions have reached agreements which better conditions than the, the provisional measure 936, such as maintenance of the monthly net income, uh, preservation of benefits already granted, uh, guarantee and employment until December and to 2020, and established of a mechanism to ensure the continuity of the, uh, the collective bargaining. Uh, 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 but of course, unfortunately, this is not the reality of the all our affiliates union around Brazil, uh, uh, which uh, have found uh, difficult to negotiate with companies since they have been pushing, like the, the comrade said, they, they pushing uh, for a, a return to the, the work, but without following the safety protocols established by word health uh, uh, organization. Even the largest uh, transnational company, the biggest ones, uh, uh, when the social dialogue is more present and, and, they, and when they adopt the, the World Health Organization security protocols, like uh, social distance, um, a temperature, a temperature measurement, the, the one and a half meters from distance inside the bus, it, during the lunch time, uh, at the in the workplace, distribution for max and spots with uh, alcohol in jail. Uh, uh, what we 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 have been following 
it very in this concern is a lot of it is the rise of the number of infection. It, it, it's extremely it, it, it fast the, the infection, uh, uh, the number of infections. And the other thing that really concerns us in that uh, in that sense uh, is that the next week they they approved in the the Congress they are already being approved in the Congress. Uh, one law, one a new proposal of law, uh, and and the the next week they they put in vote in, in Senate uh, uh, that this law states that the companies don't have to meet the agreement previously 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 reached anymore. Uh, uh, it it's crazy because all we can we we made during the, this crisis. Could be in garbage uh, 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 from the one signed from Bolsonaro because they 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 give their juridical uh, base to the companies don't met the agreement. Uh, the uh, this law is also undermine collective agreements in favor individual agreements. They suspend the need of obligatory health exams like the the dismissional exam, for example. It, the, 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 that exam, exam that the, every uh, every company should have should make to guarantee the, the 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 health of the worker. Okay, so uh, they 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 exclude this kind of exam and they set conditions below the current standards. Just to remember that before the coup, we have a standard of the work condition, then. Uh, after the coup, they got lower and now lowest the, uh, uh, in this Bolsonaro law. And uh, in, in this law is also, uh, they don't guarantee the maintenance of job during this pandemic crisis. And uh, also it, it's very, very unthinkable in, 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 in that time it, is that the, this law, it's also, uh, uh, also, give the companies uh, the, the remove the union from the negotiation. Yes, in, in the first one, they, they they said to the companies, "Okay, it's possible." Now they favor the individual agreement, and in this in this system, it, it's also provide that the company could cut fifty percent of this the severance agreements. Even the juridical ones, if a, 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 a worker lose they lose they they arm, and the the, the company should pay a, a amount of money for him. If the company pays just fifty percent, it's okay because we are in pandemic crisis. So uh, it, it it from the, the government part, this is the what they they make in the the unions, as I said. We are facing and, and struggling to to achieve good uh, agreements, but this this new law it put us very concerned. Another thing, other uh, agenda we it's are. Pretty, uh, pretty okay, uh, 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 just to finish, the other agenda we are we are talking about is about the industrial reconversion. Yes. Because during this pandemic crisis, and a little bit longer, no one will buy cars. Nobody will buy buy airplanes. Yes, we have to to maintain the the workers' life, and this is our main goal. It's just that uh, land and bread for all. Uh, fora Bolsonaro. Thank you. Fora Bolsonaro. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, brother. Yeah, we're all together. So Supporting the fora Bolsonaro, the out of Bolso with Bolsonaro, in in the because you know it's it's impossible. This is the worst leader in the world, <laughs> negationist, denial, denialist of of the pandemic, and and it's it's paying a high price. Over fifty five thousand deaths already, and over a million cases. So the Brazil is totally out of control. The pandemic, and and you know, and I'm I'm glad that we have. Unions like CNM could resisting and fighting for the workers. So moving on to Germany, 
to the sectors of mining, chemicals, and energy, which in a way were less affected in the pandemic, but also uh, they had some impact. I would like to invite our brother, Michel Wolters, to, to get his, uh, to share with us the experience of IGBT. Thank you, Michel. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, dear Walter. Um, I guess I will start with the history of the pandemic in Germany, because then you can understand that we changed our approach uh, several times. So the first case was in February. It was in an automotive company. Um, they have a subsidiary in China. And because of a business trip, the first person was infected and it was easy to follow the infection chain. Yeah, so the first cases were 14 only in Bavaria. And we thought it's okay of business travel. And if we stop business travel, we will be fine. Yeah. But then a bit later, there was a second um, case when a couple was coming home from China uh, from a more or less holiday trip. And there was a super spreading because they lived in a typical carnival area in North Rhine-Westphalia. And because of the carnival, all the festivities and so on, it was spread. So that was our first hotspot. And um, then it was hard to find uh, who infected whom. And then we have to start to think about ideas of lockdown. And the um, politician in this region was the first who closed the schools yeah, to make sure that there is no more infection. And, and this was the first start. And then it was spread it from one federal state to another. And um, the car companies decided um, to close down their um, production because of uh, low demand. Then they have a supply chain with companies in, in other countries because Europe is a very small continent, but we have a lot of states there. And at that time, there was a real hot um, problem in, in the north of Italy and a lot of Italian producers are delivering to the car industry. So the supply chain was uh, affected and it was easy to stop the uh, car production just to keep the workers for a few weeks at home to, to reduce the possibility of infection. And this influenced all our uh, companies who are in the automotive sector, producing tires, producing coatings, plastics for the interiors of the cars or plastic for, for the lamp bulbs. And they went into short time work. Yeah. So um, this part of our industry is extremely affected with short time work. Um, we don't have problem in the major fields of the chemical industry. It's hard uh, to shut down uh, a basic chemical uh, plant when they have a cracker or so. You can reduce the production, but you cannot close down it completely, only in very exceptional uh, circumstances. And, um, and the first step from the trade unions and the government was when we saw this will be a serious issue affecting our industry, was um, working on, on programs to, to safeguard the workplaces. And we had a good experience in the financial crisis with extending the short time work yeah, to 12 months or longer. So at the moment, 10 million Germans are in short time work. Not so many in our chemical business, but in total 10 million. This is nearly every fourth worker in our country. And they can stay there until the end of the year and a bit longer. Yeah. But um, even if we organize that and they have a financial basic, um, we cannot do that forever. If the uh, company is in financial crisis, they even with short time work, they have to decide to cut jobs. So far, it's not uh, a big case. So we are happy and uh, we are depending on the recovery of the demands and the um, starting of some of these production. But in general, we have not so many problems. So we um, implemented in the work uh, already safety points in the chemical industry to make sure that there is no infection. Yeah. Um, measuring fever when they come to the beginning or the, telling the people you have to stay home if you have fever, um, um, 
try to organize the work in a way that there is enough distance between two workers and have all these private protection equipment. And um, in, in end of March, there was a shortage of disinfection liquid on our market. So some of the big chemical players changed the production and they produced a lot of disinfection. So the shortage is over now. So we have it for the hospitals and for, for the normal uh, workplaces as well. So um, in this case, we, we still working with that. But we have also the experience when um, there was a case uh, of my colleague, it was a bigger chemical plant, and there were a lot of infections in, in one shift. And then they, they had a uh, problem with the workforce. Yeah? If, if you have to get rid of a full shift yeah, in the production site, and not only all were infected, but the rest has to go on quarantine, then you have no um, alternative. So they organized to shut down this plant in a safe way so that the cracker will survive. And when all the others were out of the quarantine, they restarted the plant, yeah? And in that time, they had the experience to, to look a bit more further uh, on the improvement of safety. And um, there is also a problem when it comes to family work. Um, for the white color workers, it's um, more a mental problem. They can work from home office and then it's a question, can you deal with your children and with your work on the same time? That's a big challenge, yeah. And we also observe that uh, this will create uh, an old tradition. So if both parents are at home, yeah, normally the mother has to take care of the children and the father is a bit more calm. Um, so that's a, a problem. But uh, when we have blue color workers and they um, have to go to work, but their younger kids cannot go to school, then they have to deal with that. And we have some programs on the state level that they can stay home for a limited amount of days, um, 10 or 20 days, I guess. And then their salary will be paid so that they can organize it with both for a short time. And uh, we also improved that, um, that we have some flexibility in our collective agreement in the chemical sector so that the employers, as long as they are able to do so, look a bit more how to organize it. Yeah, so not uh, reduce the work too much, but also have the possibility to take care of the children. And um, the state also offered a special amount for those who have no alternative so that they get a, a refund for the loss of income. Yeah? So that's the social work around that. And when we had the debate, because even in our headquarters, we uh, sent uh, nearly 80% of our staff at home to work from home. And um, we are now coming back. This is the first week in our office where we ask all our staff members to come back in the office. We prepared a lot with mouse mask, with um, disinfection and with distancing and so on. And uh, before we prepared a 10 point plan, you mentioned it on your website, how to organize work in a way to make sure that nobody's infected. And um, I guess it's not the time to, to tell about all the 10 points. One are obvious, yeah, like keeping distance, wearing mouth masks and so on. But there are some good things I want to mention because our American friend mentioned it as well when it comes to the change of the shift. Yeah? So one of the ideas is that the first shift has to go earlier and the second shift come later. So there is no connection in it. Yeah? And you have to take care when you have shift work also to have uh, a clear safety instruction or health instruction in the changing rooms. Yeah, even when they have to shower after work. Yeah, so you can only use every second shower. Then you have not all locker the rooms to keep the distance. One of our proposal was to use the uh, office rooms when they are close by, because uh, the office workers are in um, in home office. So just to give a chance that there is no problem with infection. And so far. Um, we haven't heard any bad experience about that, um, but to tell you what can be the um, problem, uh, last week we had a big struggle 
with uh, one of the biggest slaughterhouse in Europe. Um, there were more than 1,500 precarious workers, mostly from Bulgaria and Romania. They work 16 hour shift, they are badly paid, they work in bad housing, they sometimes share uh, one bed. So one goes to the first shift, when he leaves, the, the other come and sleep in the warm bed. So it's, it's a lot of possibilities to be infected. And for the reason that there are such a high infection, the, the federal state uh, government of North Rhine-Westphalia closed down this plant for two weeks yeah, and put a lock on, on this district. It's called Gütersloh. <coughs> and this infects all these people who are not working in the, in the slaughterhouse. They are now in trouble to um, travel, yeah, to have holidays because even in Germany, they are not allowed to, to go in any um, hotel until they can prove that they have a negative uh, corona testing, yeah? And because of this, that uh, the um, population around this slaughterhouse is infected very badly from this lockdown, there's a big debate in Germany to change this bad working conditions for these precarious workers. And this is an example that uh, um, now people have uh, understanding that bad working conditions have a bad uh, input on society and on health. And the second is that um, uh, this is a good chance to change that and to have much better working conditions. And we have good working condition in the chemical sector. We have low infection rates. And that's a good argument for being organized, I would say. Thank you very much, Brother Michael. Indeed, it's, uh, uh, we, we, we're glad that you know the chemical sector is still protected and the, with the good level of activity, not, not so many threat to, to jobs. But this case of, of the slaughterhouse is really uh, unbelievable. The, the, what is uh, set as a, you know, what exposes the, like the crisis is not the same for everybody. Huh? We're not in the same boat. We're in the same storm. But some some have boats, some have nothing, and just have to swim. And it's just because of unions, like you said, yeah, the the, the difference that it makes to be organized. So uh, we have some. Uh, thank you very much for all the brilliant contributions. You know, it's really wonderful to have to 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 learn from each other's experience here. And I, I have we have some uh, questions from the audience here. I would like to direct the first question we have here to Sister Kaisar uh, is a question from Cambodia. Suppliers in Cambodia's garment industry are using COVID-19 pandemic as a pretext to get rid of workers, especially union representatives or leadership at plant level. How can we manage to fight against employers? Thanks for your advice. Sister Kaisar, can you go over this? Um, in Myanmar, the, we do not have any policy made by the government regarding with the payment. So, in uh, last last month in May, what happened in a factory? Uh, the employer make announcement for two months factory temporary close, and saying that they will not pay anything. So, we, we, but I personally have a meeting with the management and union and explain them, according to Myanmar law, they cannot do that. So that uh, I suggest them to negotiate on wage, even they cannot pay minimum wage, uh, the union also open to negotiate. But the, the embryo, did not think about that. And uh, we also explain about EU uh, support funding to the garment industry workers. So I explain about this plan, how they can apply for it. But the Embraer make an next day, Embraer make announcement for factory close without pay. And for that, we have sent a complaint to the labor officer. After one, 
and then after one month, there, there is nothing uh, happened. Taken by the legal action, taken legal action by the labor officer. We are proposing, but uh, it did not happen. So what I did, I wrote to the brand, the brand, and uh, I asked to talk with their employer, and I explained what are the law in Myanmar, so that uh, at the end, the factory <clears throat> paid minimum wage to the workers for the factory clothes for one month. And then they decided to reopen. So because they understand, they have to pay. So that is happening in Myanmar. So we really need the government policy, something to pay to the workers because we, don't, we, we do not know uh, what will happen next. So, but we stay, we, we have this difficult situation. So we are more or less the same, uh, facing the difficulty, yeah. Thanks, Sister Kanzai. Exactly, we are, we're on the same, the same storm. <laughs> so we have another question here. Um, I, I would just ask if uh, maybe Kamal could, could take this one. Well, we have a very low union density worldwide. And when there is no union presence in the workplace, how can a worker refuse to work if he or she feels it's not safe? What kind of protection is, uh, is in place? Mom. Yeah, thank you, Walter. So as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, right to refuse an unsafe work is one of our uh, uh, fundamental rights uh, uh, for health and safety. And there are uh, some important references uh, in international conventions, even in the Universal Declaration for Human uh, Rights, uh, uh, it is very clear that uh, everyone has right to, to leave. But um, for our specific area, uh, the ILO Convention 155 clearly identifies this right for all those workers. And if, in a very simple way, plain way, I want to say that if a worker feels that uh, there is no proper environment for life or health, then uh, he or she has right to refuse or stop or shut down the work. Indeed, uh, the ILO convention refers to national level regulations, uh, uh, legislation, that needs to be supported, but uh, there is an international base and guarantee for uh, that right. Indeed, the union density is very low, 7% uh, worldwide. That means it is a political issue, particularly government regulations, national legislations are quite important for uh, this important right. And during this crisis of COVID-19, we had quite a number of cases where workers use their right to refuse the work, but they were subject to disciplinary majors, even dismissals. And uh, uh, it is quite important. Now uh, let's uh, renew our call. So even for this reason, it is important for all the workers to be unionized. Please come to the union. When you are unionized, you are safer. So uh, it, is, it is a very fair question, good question. But um, uh, uh, this one. fundamental right uh, should be in place uh, uh, in all yeah. the countries, and the unions should own it, and then should uh, should defend and implement it at the workplaces. Okay, thank you very much, Kamal. Uh, I would just uh, make uh, because we're uh, running out of time, we have to finish in in, in twenty minutes. So I would just make uh, the, the, the question, we have one question specific to Brother Didis from the UAW, and we have two questions to all the panelists. And then I, I would ask that, you know, we start with Brother Didis. I would ask you to be very concise in your answer, like three minutes, yeah, so that we can have everybody. And, and then you, you comment on, so to UAW there's a specific question and they are too generic to all the panelists. So, Brother Didis, uh, so the question is from the audience is if the protection that you put in place with the employer when returning to work is available to all workers, regardless of their they are union members or not. Well, in the case of the UAW is a closed shop, but anyway. And then uh, the two other questions 
Uh, one is specific on, on protection of, of mental health during the pandemic. If in the, in the agreements that you negotiated in your place, there were some specific protection for mental health. And the other question is, are the provisions for specific for women, protection of women in terms of childcare, schooling, and also uh, sickness pay in case of, uh, of work. So if you could uh, comment on these two, three, uh, two questions for the general panelists and one specific for the UAW, we'll start with Brother Didis, please. Have to unmute yourself, please. Unmute the Okay. You got me now? Okay. So I, I believe the first question um, was, is this PPE and these um, processes available to everyone in the workplace? Uh, okay. So obviously it's for our union members, but yes, it's for the salary workers. You know, the, the all the people under that building are all under this umbrella. So by virtue of us providing a safer environment, the people that work in the office, the management people, they all benefit from that. So there, there's, it's there for everyone. So I, I, that's a pretty simple answer. Um, I guess the comment on mental health and provisions for childcare. So as a part of our contract, if you, if you go out and you need those things, we have like many unions, we've negotiated sick leave policies. We have, we have uh, uh, workers' compensation, um, but I don't think that we have had any specific provisions in the return to work that you know, catered to women because like the first question, it applies to everybody. So there, there wasn't a gender issue there, um, but I'm not saying that that may not come up. And, you know, quite frankly, it's like I said in my presentation, we, we are working to what we know today and what we're uh, um, aware of, but that's going to change day by day. And, we could find out that um, certain genders need certain things, whether it's equipment or treatment, then we're gonna adjust to it. But we don't have anything that's gender specific. Um, it's very universal, whether it's masks or it's, uh, it's eyeglasses or it's temperature testing. Those have, they have no bearing on uh, gender. And as far as the mental health, when there are people, and, it, and this was raised early during our discussions, there are many workers, many of our members who are older people who have pre-existing conditions, and quite frankly, they don't want to leave their homes. They are scared to death of this. In the United States, we've had 122,000 deaths, ungodly amount. For those individuals, that there's a mental health issue, first of all, because they feel better by staying in their home and being quarantined and being around their family. They, not, not one of them, has been forced back to work. They all have leave provisions. And when we raised it with the employers, there was no objection. I said, we do not want to put people in harm's way or they come into that plant every single day and they're worried about picking up this virus with pre-existing conditions and going home to their family and spreading it. So I don't know if I answered all the questions, but that's just kind of the overview. So thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it, thank brothers. You. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to brother Mike Hong. Uh, can you talk a little bit about if you have some experience on, on uh, negotiating issues on on protection specifics for women or in cases of mental health? Yes, uh, CNN could are in this, in this debate, uh, it, it, and this uh, issue is very important for us because in Brazil, 80% of the, the, the workers in the health sector are women. 
and uh, 85 percent of the workers in uh, in the, the healthcare uh, uh, workers are women also and in brazil we also uh, had uh, a, a rise of the number of uh, domestic violence against the women against the, the women and so uh, the women so uh, it's very important to put in our negotiations some clause that uh, provide the, the, the women security. Not only that, but uh, in, in, in many of our affiliate unions, we had some spots in the, the, the website to denounce uh, domestic violence and, uh, and, uh, and uh, where the, the the measure, the safe measure, are not being uh, following in the in the companies. So uh, uh, next, uh, not the the next week, but uh, in July, the the Secretariat of Women in in Brazil, from CNM, put Marli, will make uh, a live debating just like this issue about the domestic violence and the the necessity to. To put the, the the women's shoe in our negotiation, we can uh, share with you and invite everybody to, to to this. Thank you very much, Mykon. Yeah, we will be willing to do, especially if you can provide interpretation in the various languages. Eh? <laughs> anyway, but uh, so uh, moving on again to Sister Kainzar. Uh, maybe uh, if we could share with us uh, if you had any specific discussions on negotiations on on providing specific protection for women and and uh, about uh, mental health during the pandemic, you, if you could share with us. Yes, um, in Myanmar, the social dialogue mechanism is weak. We do not have an institution uh, as a top of that mechanism. We have only national top of that dialogue forum so that we cannot reach any agreement on anything. So um, we do not have a uh, any policy as a, as a national level for the workers. But at the factory level, we, our union, factory level union are doing the negotiation with the management, uh, how to pay for the pregnant work, women workers. So be, because uh, according, uh, for the pregnant women, now they are, they, are, they have to be on leave with the minimum wage. So for the women, pregnant women worker, they need more money to take care for themselves. So that the, the union members, union leaders are discussing with the employer to pay more, uh, meaning not only the minimum wage, to pay attendance bonus or stay bonus, the workers you to get Mentally. So that is uh, do, doing at the factory level, but no, not at the national level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Yeah, indeed, the social dialogue is, is almost a, a, a concept that is restricted to Germany, to Germany, not to, to Europe, eh? but mostly Germany because of the co-determination system. And it's not a reality among the, around the world, unfortunately. So, Michael, would you like to, to comment on this uh, also about issues specific on, on uh, women protection and, and uh, mental mm -hmm. health? Uh, um, yeah, we had some weeks ago a webinar by our board member who is in charge of women issues. Um, and we want to raise awareness about the question of uh, our women pushed back to an outdated old fashioned role model in the family and uh, uh, public debate in Germany if there is a raising violence against women in, in the families when they are not allowed to go out yeah, and stay home, they cannot go away from the man who is um, uh, hitting her. Yeah? 
and and that's a public debate how to make sure that they have help from the outside yeah so you find in the supermarkets ads nowadays from uh, health organization to help them with their mental problems or if they have problems with violence that's a more general social approach from the society from from the civil society there's not specific on on our level in the collective agreement we just can try to rear to raise the awareness for our works council to look a bit more into this if they get some signs that they um, give information to somebody else yeah this is the um, issue when it comes to specific problems of women um, in the health system um, the corona tests are for free they are covered by the health insurance so there is no extra need for for health provision on on the level of of the companies yeah we said the company by law they are responsible for the protection of the workers so the cost for the mouse mask for uh, glass screens and for gloves or um, any other things they have to cover because it's their duty and uh, that's accepted more or less um, we have one big problem that um, the uh, school equipment in Germany is not always um, able to do digital education, especially in the poorer families. They have no laptop, no computers, so they cannot communicate with the teacher. And there's a big issue in our society that uh, uh, the children are split. Those who need uh, especially attention from the teacher, from the poorer family with, um, yeah, with a bit slower to follow the uh, topics, um, they are divided from support. And all the clever ones, the rich one, they have computers. For them, it's uh, easy going. Yeah? And that's a big discussion in our society. There are a lot of problems to, to support schools, to, to offer iPads for free for the students. But uh, the programs are very weak. That was a shortage in our um, infrastructure in the educational sector. And this is a very big um, issue, and uh, the government is pushed to, to work on that. Thank you very much, Michael. Very, very enlightening uh, um, issues that you brought to us. I think we, you know, so far I have, I'm sure that every, every one of us, we learned a lot from each other. Yeah. I think the audience learned a lot. These videos will be available uh, in Facebook and they will stay in the YouTube as well. I think we, we all learned a lot. So I would like at this point to see if any of you would like to have like one minute final words, if you'd like to, to share, some of you, any of you would like to, one minute. Mika, Michael. Okay, Mike. so should I start or yeah, Mike on? Yeah. My, uh, okay. <laughs> Both are Michael. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I was always the last. Now I, I want to start as a first. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, I think it's a good experience to have uh, the point of view from all over the world because even when it looks like the challenges are the same, you are facing different uh, uh, challenges. And it's good to know that you deal with your problems, we deal with ours. And I hope um, they're kind of sharing best practice so that everybody in the world can work with that. I would be happy if this can be an uh, outcome of that. And uh, whoever get a chance to, to listen to these idea and want to have more details, he can go back to you, Walter, or to Kemal. And then I guess every one of us is happy to provide you with additional information. So good luck and let us go through this pandemic in good condition and stay healthy. Thank you, Michael. Now Mike Con, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the initiative from the Industrial Global Union to invite us to, to talking about it's very important to, to debate the social inequality around the world in this pandemic crisis. It, it rises as a lot of, and uh, it's something very 
uh, emblematic in, in just to finish the the the, the thinking the, the, is that the first case of coronavirus in Brazil was a woman a domestic worker and a, a, a poor people and a black people it means uh, what uh, what uh, it shows what this this coronavirus it means in Brazil, it, this one million, one point, one two point million uh, of of, uh, of infected, and this five fifty five thousand deaths. It's the poor people, the black people, the precarious work, the people that don't have any support from the, and we are in a really chaos society, chaos in Brazil with the, gover uh, the Bolsonaro government. So to, to thank you the opportunity to share some point of views and stay safe and stop Bolsonaro, uh, <laughs> stay safe. Thank you, Michael. Brother Didis, your final words? I think I'm off now. I'm on mute. Can you hear me? I'm missing something. Can you yeah, hear me ahead. now? Go ahead. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I didn't hear it. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Listening to the stories. We're all in fights every day for our members, for our families, for our countries. Um, and you know, we're getting beat up here in the USA. Uh, labor unions are diminishing. We have governments against us. But you know what? Listening to all of you, and we all have the same struggles. They may be different. We have, may have the same chaos. But let's just remember this, that we are in labor, the last voice for working people. And we can never forget that. And if during this pandemic, if there wasn't labor unions, where, where would workers be without that voice? So thank you for the opportunity. It's an honor to serve our members and it's an honor to be here today. Thank you and be safe. Thank you very much, Brother Didis. Very powerful words. And we always remember, we were always saying solidarity forever. Huh? <laughs> and uh, so Sister Kainzar, your final words? Please. Yes. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I learn others. And then I noticed that Myanmar is needed more cooperation uh, between the Embraer government and the workers. So we need we need support. We need support. Myanmar workers in Myanmar. We do not get any support from the government in Embraer. Even it is very difficult to have a regular meeting and uh, difficult to discuss with them and uh, issues we, we need to solve as, and uh, we need to have a policy to handle things. So I would like to I would like uh, to ask for your help to support the uh, Myanmar trade union move, movement. Not only do the trade union for the country, uh, please uh, urge your government to continue support to the Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister. Thank you very much, Sister Kaiser. You can surely count on us on our support. So this is our role. The role of the International mm -hmm. Union is really to support all the members, all the affiliates, all the board. So this is what we are here for, basically, to support, to exchange, and, and, and we are providing assistance to our unit through the pandemic. We're providing some guidance, like this guide that was presented by, by Kamal here, and we will continue supporting uh, the unions throughout the process. So maybe Kamal can say the final Final words? Uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, this is an unprecedented crisis. 
without knowing what is going on in other parts of the world, we cannot understand, articulate uh, the situation. So this is why this kind of dialogue is quite uh, important for all of us. An industry whole uh, global union has been doing and will continue to do so in different platforms. We had yesterday a big uh, audience in the chemical sector, next week energy, mining and electronics in different sectors. We are uh, doing this. Unfortunately, this crisis has turned to be an employment crisis. And this is why as a, a, a Terry already mentioned, I believe the role of trade unions is historical. And this is why uh, 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 continue, uh, continuing to be the voice of workers, voice of voiceless is an important mission for all of us. And then we will continue to do so. And the pandemic's impact on human health is still there. And unfortunately, in the United States, in the Brazil, it is continuing, it is increasing. And then it is important to be in solidarity, whatever Bolsonaro or Trump are doing uh, in their own countries in a very stupid way. But we are the uh, uh, sensitive and the large part of the societies. Unfortunately, the economic indicators are not quite promising. And all the intergovernmental organizations report that there will be a big decline in economic growth. And yesterday, with a very optimistic view, International Monetary Fund uh, mm -hmm. declared 4.9%. But according to different organizations, if uh, there is a second hit, and the, 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 the damage will be even uh, uh, higher. So this is why uh, in this period, when everything is redesigned, then we need to stand up. We need to stick up. We need to speak up and we need to struggle together. And this is the address for all the manufacturing, energy, mine workers of, of the world is industry all, and this is our mission. And then we will continue to do so with the uh, solidarity of all our affiliates, all the workers throughout the world. Thank you very much, Kamal. And, and indeed, uh, we just last week, we had our executive committee meeting and we approved a very powerful political resolution in terms of COVID-19, which it will work as an action plan for us until the Congress that was postponed until 2021. And, and it will, you know, this is the time for us, like Kamal said, like all the panelists said, to strengthen our solidarity, to support each other, to learn from each other's experience. And I would really like to, to, to thank all the panelists today that we learned a lot from you. You know, it's a very great opportunity for us and invite all the uh, thanks for all the audience that was following us on, on the social media and Facebook and YouTube. And uh, these videos will be available. You, I will invite you to come to our website to check on our political resolution and also in this guide for return, safe return to work. And thank you very much for, for your time today. And uh, I wish you all to stay safe, stay strong, solidarity forever. <laughs>